name is Cece Collins. I'm the president of the Little Miami River Chamber Alliance. We actually cover the city of Loveland, which we're, we're talking about today, um, Sims Township, and then part of Miami Township as a chamber. And uh, we've been around for quite some time, um, about 1970, something like that. We've done this with uh, Level Magazine, I don't know, maybe four times now. <laughs> so we do, um, we've done it more with the city candidates and we're gonna be um, also working with the school candidates next um, Thursday. So um, we've kept that same format that we've done, new location, and um, just with everything that's going on with COVID, the, the school was kind enough to loan us this location and we wanted to abide by um, their rules, so that's why we're here. Um, but I first want to thank um, David Miller and Lola Magazine for being here and for uh, broadcasting this live for us. And also I want to thank my co-worker Meredith is down there, Meredith Taylor. She's sorting um, questions with Pastor Bill Hounchill. So we appreciate both them. If we could give all of them a round of applause for them. Um, and next I'm going to thank our candidates, um, and I know it's not easy to get up here and be asked questions. You don't even know what the questions are, so I get it, guys, and so thank you. I do feel, and the Chamber feels it's very important that um, the community gets to know all of you as candidates, where you stand on different issues, and quite frankly, they can look you in the eye and, and see what you think about different topics and issues. So thank you all for being here. So first, um, Tim Butler, John Hart, Kim Lukens, Neil Aubrey, Ted Phelps, and Kip Payne. A big round of applause for these guys. All right, I'm gonna um, pull up, I'm kind of stalling. Are we ready for maybe the first three questions? We can get those over here. Um, I'm gonna bring up our MC, and I'm gonna step out of the light here and bring up Judge Brad Greenberg. Really appreciative of his time. Um, we know that he's busy throughout the day and he takes his evening to come help us do this and do it in a very fair and concise way. So um, Judge Brad Greenberg, thank you for being here. Thank you, CC. Um, appreciate you being invited to uh, be part of this. Um, I was on Lullet City Council for nine and a half years, and so uh, it feels good to be involved and stay connected uh, to, to the city of Loveland. And I um, also wanted to thank uh, all the candidates for um, being here and for putting your name on the ballot. Uh, it takes uh, courage to put your name on the ballot and hold yourself out there as someone that wants to lead the city. Uh, but we need, we need good leaders. Uh, we need people to make the decisions. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank all of you for, for uh, stepping up uh, once again. Uh, I wanted to just say a couple things about the, the format. Um, there's going to be a, a brief two-minute opening statement from uh, each candidate, uh, and then we're going to have uh, questions uh, to uh, all the candidates. Each, each candidate will get to answer the same question. Uh, they'll take turns. They get two minutes to answer each question. Uh, and then at the end of all the questions, uh, each candidate will get about two minutes to give a, a closing statement. Uh, I wanted to stress that this is, this is not a debate. Uh, it's not a, a question and answer session with the audience. Uh, it's not really a discussion with the audience. It's just going to be a forum where they're responding to written questions uh, and giving uh, the public a chance to tell you exactly where they stand uh, on various topics. So, uh, with, with that being said, uh, I think we're ready. Yeah, I just want to let the candidates know this is your, your you get two minutes as we stated, this is your 30 second warning, just to give you, you know, time to wrap up. This is your 10 seconds, we're going to stop. <laughs> just want to be fair on everybody's time. So, I have a timer on my right. Thank you. So, we're ready to start then with the uh, opening statements. We are. Okay. All right. And uh, Mr. Butler, you're going to go for it. Thank you, Judge Greenberg. Uh, thank you, Little Miami River Chamber Alliance and Loveland Schools for hosting this event. We really appreciate it. My name is Tim Butler. I'm a 32-year resident of the city of Loveland. My wife Jackie and I have five children, 
uh, two of whom live in the Cincinnati area, two in California, and one in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I'm an attorney and chief litigation officer for a multinational company, and for the past year and a half or so, I've had the privilege of uh, working in a family business, Mile 42 Coffee in downtown Buffalo. Maybe some of you have been there. If not, I'd love to see you there sometime. I've had the honor of representing the people of the city of Loveland for four years on Loveland City Council. During that time, we've certainly had some, some notable issues and notable questions and opportunities presented to the city council. Some of those um, I've agreed with the majority on, and some of those, frankly, I've disagreed with the majority of council on. But I can assure you that each vote I've taken each position I've advanced, each opportunity presented to me, I've taken into account my oath of office to the United States and Ohio Constitution, the law and ordinances of the city of Loveland, and most importantly, what is in the best interest of the people of Loveland? I've always stood by that, and I will continue to stand by that if given the opportunity to serve. We are public servants. We are elected to serve you, the people of Loveland. We have a problem of congestion and, frankly, out of control development, especially in and around our downtown. Our city needs a chance to breathe, to carefully plan how we balance opportunity while keeping Loveland as a place we want to raise our families. It's time. It's time. Um, I hope we have the opportunity to discuss this further tonight. And uh, thank you again for this opportunity to discuss the issues. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank CC and her team for putting this together. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Miller for making this available to all the people that can't be here uh, and have to view this from home or want to view it at a, at a later date. Uh, the opportunity to get to know us as candidates is hugely important and being informed voters going into November is, is critical. Um, so I appreciate all of you taking the opportunity to come out here and, and see what we have to say. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself, I'm John Hart. Um, been a resident here for 10 years. I have been married to Randy, my wife, for 15 years. We have two small children, a second grader and a third grader here in Loveland City Schools. I myself have been a employee here at Loveland City Schools for the last seven years and an educator for the past 18. Um, been working on some, with the city for the last five years, doing most, most of my work with the Recreation Board, been sharing that for the past three years. We've been doing some really neat stuff, uh, working with doing our park evaluations and making sure that the parks in the city uh, are up to par for the residents here. And most notably, coming up soon, we have an Isbet Park plan. We're going on bringing Isbet up to par with the downtown area. Spruce that up, make it the jewel of love that I really believe it could possibly be. Uh, most recently, I've been working as the chair of the Comprehensive Master Planning Committee. We are doing some, a team of nine people that are doing some excellent work uh, visioning for the next 10 years of love, uh, working with potential development on Love Madeira, working with what is potential, what potential the outer ring of Love and downtown has, and where we want to go as a city and listening to people, speaking to community members throughout this entire process to make sure we're engaging as many people as we can. So I look forward to tonight's discussions and answering questions, and I uh, hope to earn your support here in November. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Kim Lukens, and I'm a uh, single home owner in Brandywine. And I moved into Brandywine uh, October 15th, 2020. And I, of course, I was in the middle of COVID, and um, I was thinking a lot about being outdoors. And when I, when I walked out of, or I drove out of Brandywine, I saw this beautiful um, piece of land. And um, I thought, 
wow, that's really beautiful. I really love that. And then I would go down 48, and I saw another area that's called Apple Blossom. And I thought to myself, wow, that would be a great ice skating rink, uh, a place for families and kids to uh, use their, um, their sleds, um, you know, keep all those trees, and, uh, you know, like um, New York has uh, the, John, the Rockefeller Center and ice skating rink right in the middle there. Um, because I'll just be really honest with you all, I am very much for outdoor recreational um, development and um, doing that kind of project, in my mind, it would be very sustainable, be very little impact. So, um, oh my. Okay, so, uh, okay, well, thank you all for listening and thank you all for coming and um, uh, thank you all who are listening and um, that was, I'm just not good at short and to the point. <laughs> so, uh, I'll talk about Facebook if you all want to ask me more questions. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, CC and Chamber, for putting this on, uh, for Judge Chamber for hosting this, and uh, local residents for being here. I appreciate that. Um, my name is Neil Worry, and I'm seeking re election to City Council. I also am currently on the CIC, which is the Community Improvement Corporation, and the Public Relations and Communications Committee. I was born and raised here in Loveland, so I've been here for over 64 years. My parents installed in me many uh, values, but mostly moral, honesty, and a sense of good hard work, which I carry forward in my life today. Married to my wife Lynn, who's sitting down here, and we've been married for 38 years, currently living in the house that, we built, that I built 34 years ago. We've raised our two children there, and uh, was just uh, awarded a granddaughter, granddaughter uh, nine months ago. I retired back in May, and uh, I enjoy woodworking, working around the house, uh, community items, family, and camping. During my 60 years, I've witnessed Loveland change significantly, and the downtown district has become a, a model for other cities to follow. This happens because the residents get involved. We sure did four years ago. Standing up, voicing their opinions through dialogue and engagement. This happens here in Loveland as a direct result of good leadership. A council that works cohesively together, a staff that is fiscally responsible, the city employees that are dedicated to their jobs and to our community. I believe I have demonstrated my passion for Loveland and have made good best decisions on issues and sound decisions. I ask for your vote uh, in the re-election. Um, I have a great sense of uh, organization, uh, rational decision making, and inclination to honesty, common sense, and integrity. Again, I ask for your vote. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ted Phelps, and um, again, kudos, thanks to Meredith and CC and Pastor Bill and uh, Judge Greenberg for being here. Thanks to the school for, for hosting us. Um, like me, I too am running for, for re-election, and um, I've lived in Loveland for 27 years, uh, raised my kids here, and my wife and I live in the Pheasant Hills in the Lake neighborhood. And the reason I ran two terms ago was to give back to my community, and that's, that's why I'm running again, for all that it's given to me. And what has it given to me? Well, great neighborhoods, great people, um, excellent city services. It's just a comfortable, wonderful place to live. And I want to continue to see Loveland thrive. I want to s see it as I have moving in great directions and continuing to move in, in good directions. And uh, that, in part, comes from good, strong community leadership. And I'm not talking so much about me in, in capacity as a leader, but I think more in terms of we. And I think our city is amazing because we have an incredibly dedicated and competent city staff and employees, um, 
that we have individuals that are willing to make a significant business investments in the neighborhood and in the downtown area. I think we have a great committee system that's been basically run by citizens, um, made up of very talented uh, citizens. Chamber of Commerce, Farmers Market, LSFD, our police, the list goes on and on. So I like being part of what has been, for me, a fairly highly functional city. Uh, I think we're working well. We're getting things done. Um, I want to be open uh, and transparent. I want to hear all the viewpoints, and I want to be part of the team that is doing these beneficial things for the city. Um, I will provide leadership when and uh, time. time is called for, and I'll speak out on matters I don't agree with. I am a civil servant. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kit Ping. I uh, want to thank everybody that has already been listed, so I'll just cut that short. But um, You know, I, I've been in the area since 1989. I moved here with my wife, uh, Teresa, who is with me tonight. Um, we've lived in this area and have enjoyed living here. Every time we have relocated, which we've spent three times, we've moved about a mile around in the same area because we love living in this area. Uh, we have two kids, Abby and Levi, who graduated from Loveland Schools and went on to UC and graduated from there. We have one grandson, Luke, who is uh, nearing two years old, and so that's a little bit about our family. Um, one of the things that I believe is that each of us must take the talents we have and make good use of them. Um, for the last several years, I have owned a business and, and operated that here in, in our town. I'm a structural engineer, and my, that's what my firm does. Uh, I have also been a leader in my church and involved there for 30 years and uh, heavily involved, in fact. Uh, more recently, I have been uh, involved again with the city after having been away for a few years. And so I've been on three different committees with the city. And the reason why I'm running, when often asked that question, why would you do this? In fact, a lot of people say, why are you crazy enough to do this? Um, but the reason why I've always responded is, I feel that we each have to make use of those talents we have. And I believe that I have qualifications that uh, make me capable of doing this job. Um, I think that it's important that we have an involved citizenry. Since I have worked in this area, since I've lived in this area, I have seen many different people come and go from city council. And uh, whether I agreed with them or not, I think it's uh, probably fair to say they were all doing the best they could for our community. I would like to have that opportunity to serve you in that way, and so I ask for your vote. All right, here's the uh, first question, and Mr. Hart, you're going to go first to respond, and then we'll, we'll stick with the same order. So, um, the first question, what do you think is the single greatest attribute in being an effective council member? Tell about a recent action you've taken that exemplifies this characteristic. Um, I would say, for, from my point of view, the most, most effective leaders I've ever been around are those that listen and communicate well. They, they work on relationships, they listen to people, they don't just hear them and move on and get ready to say the next thing that they're going to say in the argument. They actually listen and fundamentally want to know your perspective. Um, and I think that is one thing that I do very, very well. Uh, it's part of my job, it's part of my life. I'm, I'm good at listening and working through ten, at times complex issues uh, to find compromise. I think that's what we do as, as a government, as a community, to move us forward in the best way possible. We need to, we, it's, it's about compromise because Everybody gets everything they want. That's not really realistic, right? Everybody's going to have to give a little bit to get us to the right place. So a good example of that from really recently would be the Nisbet Park plan that we worked on through the Recreation Board. Um, the, the park board had decided that we wanted to move the playground to a certain part of the park, and we had a community, community engagement event where it was more than clear that the community did not agree with us. We went back to the board, had a meeting the, within two or three weeks, and we spoke, and we were all glad to have heard that. It was four opinions, and we had the other part of 30 to 40 opinions go up and tell us we were all wrong. Okay, good. Well, the community clearly spoke, 
And in our next rendering, so we're getting ready to meet again here very soon, the, the playground will be moved back over to where it was. So um, listening to what the community wants and actually wanting to know, not just listening to give to, to pacify you as a community or as a resident, but listening to what to actually know what your opinion is, what you want out of your community in which you live in, and then responding to that as a leader is, is critically important. qualifications are, well first of all, I'm qualified to be a life coach, I'm qualified to be a social worker, and I'm qualified to be a counselor. So, so that means that I have a lot of training in developing relationships and uh, trust, conflict management, um, uh, communication, listening, um, uh, object and objective, um, problem solving, those kinds of things. So, uh, I moved, like you heard, I moved into my house about a year ago, and so I had to be on, my, my, my latest accomplishment was being on a tight budget and interviewing different people to do jobs, like, I mean, different jobs, then, um, listening to their perspective on, you know, why I should remove the glass, why I shouldn't remove the glass, I mean, just all kinds of things, um, you know, why I should keep the hardware, why I shouldn't keep the hardware, so that, to me, there was, there was just, there was, it was budgeting and going back and forth and looking at different natural resources and it was quite an accomplishment, I didn't go over my budget and, um, I, I had a lot of those different challenges with a lot of different people, a lot of the trades, and um, so I guess I could, I definitely think that I can bring that to a bigger perspective. Um, with all of you, uh, you know, it is about compromise, and it is about listening, and it's not about, um, it's not about me, um, it's not about for you to understand me, it's to try to understand you all. So I um, will just tell you that I have a sustainable model. Time. So I'll, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> the single uh, effective thing that I feel as a, a leader is uh, 64 years here alone. I know people. I know what is going on, where we've been. Uh, from a small community of 3,000 to where we are now, with the census just getting out 13,300 homes, I think it is. Um, the dialogue with residents is, is number one. We must listen to what the people have to say. Um, and re most recently, over the last few days uh, or weeks, I've been doing, uh, I call them campaign walkabouts, so visiting your neighborhoods, reading literature, and speaking with those who were at home and wanted to engage in a conversation. And I carry my little notebook with me up to the door and I make the notes. And you know, the, the, the number one issue uh, that I've heard is traffic. <coughs> Parking is in there too, but traffic is number one. And so I, I would say that that is probably my pet peeve in love. Uh, I started studying it uh, four years ago when I was elected on the council. Uh, came up with some neat ways to handle five points uh, intersection as well uh, down where uh, uh, the firehouse is. Um, so, you know, taking um, current issues with those items and saying, how do we fix it? What's the best way to fix it? And I uh, would just, uh, I can't ask uh, that you uh, give me the opportunity to uh, continue to do that. Uh, and I'll do the best job I can. Thank you. Well, um, I think the greatest attribute in being an effective city councilman is fairly simple. Being uh, a good listener, being a good communicator, and being able to uh, obtain consensus. And um, you know, politics has been described as the art of what is possible, and I think 
in this city, it works pretty well. And so far as decision making, I think, is done um, on a variety of levels that includes staff, it includes our city manager, it includes city councilman, but it also includes the people who make up our committee system as well as you who come and speak to us about these issues, whether it's in council or a phone call or an email. And I think, um, you know, you, you, a good council person can um, hear things that maybe that they don't agree with or that they hadn't heard before and, and take that into consideration. And I think that's important to do. I think it's also important to defer to our professional staff, our, our city manager, after all, we've hired him to, to uh, carry out the day-to-day -day business of, of the city. Um, and defer to our committees as well. Again, these are places that I think are microcosms of the democratic process. And to me, that's been my best experience. Uh, not so much being on council, I like it a lot, but I like being on the committees I've served on, building consensus, having people sort through difficult issues, uh, analyze them, <coughs> jointly and then come to a decision. Um, I've had the pleasure to serve on a number of committees including law and ordinance, charter review, council rules review, um, the mayor uh, years ago, Brad Greenberg, had me to examine our taxation uh, system as well. Um, I've also served on the, the fire station 63 move committee. So that's the kind of stuff that I think is uh, very helpful to becoming and maintaining uh, leadership. Thank you. I hope all the questions aren't about your best or favorite thing. Uh, my son used to ask me all the time, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite? And I always say, I don't know. And the reason I say that is because I think there's many, many things that are critical to answering questions like that. Uh, in this particular case, if I had to pick one thing, I think I would say empathy. Um, I'm not on a fixed income, and I have a job. But the ability to hear someone who is on a fixed income and is retired is important to understanding why they're telling me what they're telling me. And so I think it's important to hear what people have to say in that regard. Um, an example recently of, of trying to, to do that is going door to door. Anyone who knows me uh, will tell you I'm the guy that sits in the corner and does nothing because I'm a very private, introverted kind of person. Um, going door to door is uh, about the most painful thing I've done in the last three months. Uh, but I think it's necessary and I think it's important. And that's the reason why I'm doing it. Um, because I don't think you can do this job without hearing what people have to say, without empathizing with their positions and understanding that. Because at the end of the road is a decision that has to be made by the city council. And those decisions are sometimes going to upset some people, but you have to have at least heard what people have to say before you make those decisions. Um, and then, so that's why I would say that to me is perhaps the most important. Thanks. <clears throat> One of our residents reminded me today that the organizational chart of the city of Loveland doesn't show the city manager at the top, it doesn't show the mayor at the top, it doesn't show city council at the top, it shows the people at the top. And I thought about that, and she was absolutely correct. So I think the most important attribute of a city council member is the ability to represent the interests of the people. We are elected servants, we're elected to serve you the people, even in the face of headwinds, even in the face of opposition from other members, even on council. I'll give you a very a recent example of that. About a year ago, um, our council had to decide whether to rezone property just north of downtown Loveland from single family homes, which would have been about seven homes in a five acre lot, to multifamily condominiums, which resulted in 25 to 26 condominiums on that lot which will mean increased congestion, increased traffic. The residents of the area adjoining those, that area spoke unanimously against that proposition. 300 of those residents signed a petition asking council to reject that rezoning. I went to that property, I listened to the people, I walked the property, 
and I understood where they were coming from. And I voted against that rezoning at planning and zoning, and I, re I voted against that rezoning at city council because the people didn't want it. The 300 people, did the developer want it? You bet he did. He's gonna make a lot more money because that property was rezoned to 25 condominiums instead of seven homes. And there was headwinds. I was one of two council members who voted against that property. Council members need to be able to be strong and represent the interests of the people, even in the face of opposition and headwinds. We represent the people. Thank you. All right, the next question is one that uh, I bet everybody could have predicted you would get. Uh, we had a lot of questions from the uh, audience uh, yeah, about this. It's about parking. We're going to start with uh, Ms. Lukens on this question. Here's the question. Uh, do you agree that parking is a problem? If so, what do you want to do about it? And please be specific. Ms. Lukens. Yes, I think parking is a problem. What do I want to do about it? Well, I have thought about it, actually. Um, I thought about it a lot today. Um, it's, real, it's real simple. I really don't believe we need any meters. Um, I, I think that if there were uh, somebody that could help us with traffic flow, I have a very sustainable thought process, which a sustainable thought process is just a model that the United Nations put together back in 2015. And simply for this, it would be, um, uh, you can uh, just upgrade, you can cut down trees and use the trees for pavement, you can have uh, crushed stone for pavement, you can do very systematic recyclable bumpers, and it would be really all very sustainable and recyclable and very, I think, very easily done with a minimal amount of money. So, um, yeah, take, or take the meters, I think, honestly, on, on the main road should be really taken away, and I think it should be cars and bicycles. You know, that's what I think it should be, and I, I do believe that there is enough space back there if properly, um, but if we need an expert for traffic flow and for pedestrian flow, for all of the parking to be to be handled, um, uh, ten seconds. So, I, oh, is that thirty? Okay. Um, I don't know what I mean. There would be side a sidewalk. There, you know, a, 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 I wouldn't want to like. Uh, try to impose on the railroad tracks or put a, you know, take the entire uh, hill area and flatten it out and, you know, put a bunch of equipment in there and disrupt the, just um, affect the environment as far as the ground and the, I don't know, the geothermal no, underneath. Fine. So I, that's what I would do. I do agree that parking or more parking and traffic is, is an issue. What to do about it? Um, you know, council has taken a great deal of time to study the problems. Um, we put together a committee that um, studied the, you know, all the issues that, that we have down panel as well um, about the, the parking meters. The parking meter program um, was a was a very good program for us. Um, it gave us a lot of stats, um, and we found out that if we, if the, the reason for the meters was to control parking. Um, we heard from the businesses downtown that, you know, the, the long-term parkers take up all the private spots. But we worked with the, the cyclists, uh, and people that were going to take long, long, you know, eight, six-hour trips or on the bike truck, and asked them, move to this parking lot. It worked. <laughs> By putting in the meters, it kept it that way. So the meter problem, the meters are over at this point, and the meters will be removed. Um, we don't know exactly what we're going to do moving forward, um, but it's a, it's it's one of those things that um, um, we have to 
I'll put it this way, we have, have to gather the information before we can do that. The parking garage, that's been a big issue. Make it real clear, there is no parking garage yet, okay? We don't know if it's going to happen. We haven't heard from you. We don't have the numbers. Um, we still don't know if we're going to put up, um, you know, the one story, two story, or if it's just going to be a lot. Those are things council has to figure it out. And until we do, there's no garage. Okay? Thank you. So if I heard the question correctly, does Loveland have a parking problem? And uh, I would say yes and no. Outside of downtown, I don't think there's much of a problem. Um, I, I know I need to be flipped, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying that in part because I would like to think that we will continue to see development out level and Madeira Road that will provide for people who want to come to the central area, central business area, to perhaps park there and then walk downtown. That's one suggestion. There really is no one silver bullet on what would solve what is a downtown parking problem. And it's not just a parking problem, it's a traffic problem. And parking problem breeds somewhat, I think, the traffic problem insofar as there are more people coming downtown than there are places to park. Those that want to uh, search for a parking spot are increasing the traffic, especially during events and on sunny weekends and spring, summer, and fall. Uh, we're, we're, it's, it's a three season problem, honestly. But it's not a bad problem. We're a desirable community. Um, we can do things to help the situation. We've tried and have in place some technological uh, improvements, uh, uh, timing the lights downtown, especially during um, rush hour. Uh, the city has pursued uh, the type of uh, technology that allows us to, to do that better. Um, we are, uh, uh, of course, uh, producing a little more turnover with those meters. I think the meters, we're, we need to examine them closely, but I think some of them should stay because it's some of the businesses who have their spots taken by somebody like me, a middle-aged man who comes down for a Saturday and goes out eight hours riding his bike and leaves his, his SUV with a bike rack in that spot. But I think probably the best solution that's also the most expensive is a parking garage. And I think it makes sense that if we provide a place for cars to park that can be accessed by people coming to town, either downtown or from Route 48, uh, to enter and park and then move on. Thank you. I'll second what uh, Councilman Phelps said and say that yes, I, I think it's, it is a problem in downtown. It's not a problem in other parts of town. Uh, it's also, as, as he alluded to, a, a timing issue. Uh, there are times when I go downtown and circle and circle and circle trying to find a place and struggle to find a spot. But there are also times when you pull up and there's plenty of parking. So it is a, a problem that needs to be addressed. I think that there are opportunities to, uh, to handle that through perhaps a parking garage, perhaps surface lots. Um, I think there are other things that can be done too that would help alleviate the situation. Uh, many times, for example, um, a typical Saturday, there is a lot of traffic that is uh, generated by the, the bike path. Um, people are coming down to exercise by riding a bike. If there is a convenient way to get from parking to the bike trail, um, that might be something that could be promoted. And so perhaps uh, opportunities um, over on the, uh, the other side of the river from downtown to introduce parking and, and try to shift some of that traffic into bike traffic across the bridge might be a way to help alleviate things without spending as much money. So I think there are a number of opportunities that can be considered. Uh, certainly it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, two years ago in this uh, forum, one of the questions asked was, what about the parking garage? Are we going to take care of parking downtown? So it, it's something that is not a new problem. There's no simple, cheap answers that completely solve it. Um, but it's something that needs to be um, certainly worked on and addressed because it is a continuing uh, problem for the residents. Thank you. Well, I can't debate that parking is an occasional challenge 
Um, as noted, it's a, it's a challenge of timing, it's a challenge of uh, seasonal. Um, the answer, in my view, is not a 10 to $12 million parking garage. That is a debt which will be placed on the backs of Loveland's taxpayers um, for this generation and the next generation. Once we dig into that area and put a 10 to $12 million parking garage there, we're stuck with it for 30 years. Is that what we want to do to a charming downtown? I don't think so. I think it will also increase, rather than alleviate traffic congestion, it's going to make it worse because you're going to have up to 300 cars crossing the bike path, coming in off of Route 48, making traffic problems even harder for those people who live north of downtown in the Warren County area. Um, there's any number of reasons why it, it doesn't, it's not a feasible outcome uh, for the parking challenges which we have. There are other ways that we can address it much more reasonably, much less costly than a 10 to $12 million parking garage. For example, we have the East Loveland Nature Preserve, up to 80 spaces, which is rarely used. As a city, we can communicate better the availability of that lot. We can provide shuttles, perhaps, from remote lots, which are um, oftentimes not too congested in busy times for downtown. Um, for example, the uh, uh, lots on Lovell Madeira at Shopper Haven and Goodwill are rarely used in those times when downtown is crowded. Perhaps a shuttle could accommodate those people who want to come and visit our downtown. It'd be much cheaper and much less of a, a permanent solution to what all of us have recognized here on this panel is an occasional seasonal problem. The city's own studies show that the parking garage would not be used that often, and it's not financially feasible. So my recommendation is that we take that off the table. Thank you. Uh, yes, parking is clearly an issue, uh, mostly because all of our residents view it as an issue. So clearly council needs to take this up. And I think one of the ways that we can take that up is through a three parking garage. I think that is something that would solve a lot of the problems. Now, if that is fiscally appropriate for us to do, and I don't know what those, those look like. I'm not on council right now. I have not seen what those studies are, and I've not seen a lot of those, those financials. But if it's fiscally responsible to do that, to take that step, I think it is an appropriate step to solve one of our parking issues. I think there are other other avenues, though. I think it's almost um, contiguous to talk about this as a connectivity issue. Talk about sidewalks coming from other neighborhoods so people can walk. Talk about something that the downtown master plan and the comprehensive master plan have introduced as a lip on the bridge so the cyclists can move from one side to the other safely. So that our sidewalks are safer. So that people can comfortably walk into downtown because a lot of people would love to do that. Um, I think those are all valid, valid ways to solve a parking problem that is, as has been noted, seasonal and, but also major when it is a problem. I think there's opportunity there with the parking garage, as well as some some extra sidewalks and with the lip on the bridge will help our cyclists move safely through, through the town. question Mr. Corey gets to uh, lead off with. Um, here's the question. When I see an obvious grouping of candidate election signs, I draw the conclusion that they are forming a cabal with an undisclosed agenda and not necessarily representing the citizens. I ask each of the candidates, is that the case? If so, what is this agenda? And if it's not so, why the grouping of the election signs? Well, I'm one of the four that are part of that group. And um, the other three are up here tonight also. Um, they'll, they'll address it as well. We are not one voice. We are four. We are four independent thinkers. But we've got four signs together because we'd like to have this cohesive group on the next four years to this council. Um, 
There's no hidden agendas. There's nothing behind the door. And it's that simple. We, uh, we, we put our signs together because we, we feel cohesively we're a, a good group. We get along with each other. We disagree with each other. And that's okay. The, the moment we disagree, it makes us stronger and makes us come to a conclusion that what is the best thing? Thank you. Well, Loveland is a sign town. When we have uh, races for local elections, I've noticed we, we like to get our signs out, and I get caught up in that for sure. And I appreciate those that have taken uh, my sign, and yes, because we have kind of worked together to campaign together, we see eye to eye on many issues, not all issues. Um, I'm telling you, the reason we're doing it is not for any secret agenda. It's, from my perspective, it's just easier to get your campaign and your name out there because I don't want to knock or I don't want to have seven different people knock on my door. I'd rather if there's a group that has similar aims and similar uh, attitudes towards um, the city and it has beliefs on similar issues, especially the big ones like the parking garage, I'm more than happy to have them take some of the uh, burden that it is to get out to every one of the doors in love and we try but it's really hard so it's more from my perspective a uh, practical benefit um, and yes um, I appreciate the fact that I have three other people on council that are supporting me and uh, I support them so that's the signal we want to send four excellent um, I think strong-minded um, leaders uh, who, who want to be on the city council, two of whom are newcomers. And I was helped in my first election by having a pairing of other signs. Um, it happened again four years ago. Um, Mr. Butler's sign was with mine. So it happens, and there's no hidden agenda. That's all I can say. Thank you. I'm number three from the four, as you probably know. Um, yeah, there's no hidden agenda, there's no cabal, there's no um, group of four that's trying to ramrod something through on everyone. Uh, that's, that's not the reason. Um, frankly, as a newcomer to this, uh, it was something that I kind of embraced because I thought, well, this, this is going to help me um, to have people that have done this before to kind of steer through it. Um, I, I'm not experienced at going door to door and talking to people and uh, hearing how others have done that was helpful. Um, so it's been helpful in that regard. The other thing too is that this is not something new to Loveland. Loveland, since I've lived here for 30 years, I've seen signs go up in groupings. Um, and I think it's helpful to some people. Um, those of you that are here tonight have come out to hear what we have to say and, uh, and that's that's how you've chosen to be informed. There's other people that tend to do their voting more by association, and so I know Kip Payne, and I like him, and I like what he stands for, and if he's with these other three guys, that must mean that he respects them. And, and I do. Uh, I, I've come to know these three gentlemen here in the last few months, um, and to a greater extent than I did before. And, it, you know, I, I think that they would be good people on council. And so I'm willing to stand and put my name alongside of theirs. As they've already said, uh, the two that have spoken so far, um, yeah, we're not lockstep. Uh, there's things we disagree on. There's going to be times when we don't agree with one another. But that's okay, too. Uh, the one last thing I guess I would say is, you know, uh, Councilman Phelps is actually probably a, a substantial part of why I'm actually doing this because of the respect I found for him in the two years that we were on uh, different committees together. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not uh, a cabal, it's just uh, a grouping of people. In 2017, I was part of a group of four. I said at that forum in 2017, very similar to this one, that if I had the honor of being elected, my loyalty would be not to those three people with whom I was running at that time, 
but to you, the people of Loveland. And I stood by that pledge for four years, oftentimes in the face of opposition from other members of council, but I, that was okay because my loyalty, my oath was to the people of Loveland. Because of that, I was not invited back to the group of four. And that's their right, that's their prerogative. But you should ask yourself, through my experience, what does that mean when someone exercises independent judgment and takes positions which he thinks are in the best interests of the city of Loveland? Is this truly an independent group of like-minded thinkers, as was presented here tonight by these first uh, four, three gentlemen? I would say no. I would say that there's a compelling compulsion to toe the party line, to vote with the majority. And I challenge Mr. Phelps and Mr. Ori and the rest of this evening, in response to any question, to identify one time in four years on a substantive matter when they voted against the majority. Are these true independent thinkers? You need independent thought, people who are committed to serve the people, not to serve the group that brought them into office, not to serve a party, but to serve the people of the city of Loveland. And I've demonstrated that over four years. And if given the honor, I'll demonstrate that for the next four years. Thank you. I guess I get to do the honor of being the fourth member of the group. Um, no, to, to, to directly answer the question, no. Uh, we, there's there's no hidden agendas. There's there's none of that going on. I would echo, uh, quite frankly, Mr. What Councilman Butler has said. Uh, our first priority and our first our first duty is to serve the community, and that's important. And that's I take that very seriously. My introduction to politics was in in Loveland anyway was through former Mayor Linda Cox, who um, I spoke to at length about getting into this. Um, and she kind of led me down a path of getting into the recreation board first and do some committee work first. You need to dip your toe in before you go, you know, go crazy and go, you know, jump into city council. Which, as I found out over the last two or three months, is it's a it's a it's a big step. It's a, it's a big commitment. Um, and my wife's told me several times, did, did you know you were signing up for this? <laughs> I do not. So. And it's, and it's great. It's what I'm here for. It's, it's what I want to be a part of because I think these conversations are important. I like being a part of them. I, I want to have a seat at the table as we take these next steps into our future. Um, the, the three other gentlemen, we're not in lockstep on anything. We, we disagree, have disagreed on, on several issues. Um, but the reality is on more of the major issues that are facing us in the near future, we, we do generally align on, on the best course of action that we feel is the best course of action. Now, moving forward, that will come with a lot of community input. The voice that needs to be heard is yours. The voice that needs to be echoed in the council chambers is yours. And, and I believe that I am a person that will do that. I, I'm committed to that. I think that is the most important thing that we can do as council people is listen. And, and I want to assure you that that will be my first priority. Well, I am an independent thinker. <laughs> My signs are not with any of the candidates that are running. So with that being said, I definitely uh, take it input from each individual. Um, honestly, I am here because Mr. Butler had alluded to the apple blossom um, scenario and it seems to me like the people were not heard. If they were heard, then it was it was dismissed. And you know that just that really frustrates me. And so um, then the Grailville the Grailville development that um, uh, the same thing. There's quite a bit of, of, of you people that you have opposition and Apparently, these types of developments are 
uh, occurred with you know who the council members are. So um, I, uh, I already told you what, I, what a possibility of development would be where the Apple Blossom area is. And I'll just be upfront. I'm I'm a creative out of the box thinker. <laughs> you know, there's more than one way to um, bring economic joy and prosperity to an area outside of um, restaurants and eateries. So um, uh, anyway, so I don't know what else to say other than I'm definitely an independent, independent thinker, and I know how to work together. Uh, and collaborate together, and you know these decisions that have been made apparently way before I became a resident here is not a reflect a reflection of me. So, okay. Uh, the next question uh, actually starts out with a statement, and then morphs into a question at the end. Uh, and um, Mr. Phelps is going to get to go first on this one. Uh, the topic is annexation. Uh, council is considering annexing 95 acres of land just east of downtown owned by Grailville. There is a known developer planning to build 250 homes on the site. If council approves this annexation, the property will be developed and the city will be responsible for providing all public services uh, sewer, water, police, and fire, while well, Miami Township will retain the right to collect all property taxes. If the annexation is denied, the property, property will likely stay as is because of the exorbitant cost to bring services from Claremont County. Now, here's the question part. What is your position on this proposed annexation and why? Mr. Phelps. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to note that you know annexation is not a process that's initiated by council. It's initiated by landowners or property owners, whether it's multiple or, or one. In my history on council just in the past two years, uh, there have been two um, property owners who have come to us and asked to annex. One of them was great, uh, Grand Sands, the, the volleyball um, place, and then the second one is the current owners of Railville. And annexation is sought out for reasons that benefit both the landowner, the uh, city, and I think in this case also any uh, purchaser of the property. Um, there are several types of annexation. The, the one that's being discussed for Railville is a type two. And in that case, yes, Miami Township uh, doesn't go away. It, it still gets its property taxes, but so does Loveland. It's not one or the other, it's both and a type two. Um, sure, there's costs associated with extending city services, but there's a huge return as well in terms of increased property valuations, increased property taxes, uh, and just the, the greater benefit of having additional people who will create a, economic activity in the city. So um, it, it, it's in the phase where it's, it's not done yet. Um, it's been uh, proposed. Uh, it is, uh, I think, something that will take probably the next six months to flush out in terms of what ultimately happens because it involves the county commissioners of Claremont County who have to approve it first, um, and then it involves uh, council action, council consideration. So at this point in time, to answer the question, though, I'm, I'm favorably inclined to explore it. Sorry. Thank you. As far as the annexation goes, um, Anytime we look at annexing an area to the city, there's obviously pros and cons for the, the, the city, and there are pros and cons for the residents, as well as the residents that are outside of the city. When my wife and I first moved here, we lived over just off of Fields Earl Road when Fields Earl was two lanes, Mason Montgomery was two lanes, there was one traffic light, and you had to drive a long way to come to another traffic light. And it's amazing what has been developed up there. 
Um, and the reason I bring that up is that I think it's a demonstration that whether you have a township or you have a city, you have development when an area is popular. Uh, good, bad, or otherwise, Loveland is a great place and a lot of people want to live here. My son and daughter, -in -law, or my daughter and son-in-law uh, spent a year trying to find a place in Loveland and never did find a place. Um, it's just a, it's a, a place people want to go. And so, um, if this area is not annexed into the city, I don't think that means it won't be developed. Um, I like the idea of the city having more control of the development in terms of trying to steer things in a certain direction. Because I, I think we just have to face the fact that there is going to be continued development. Um, with regard to the, the cost aspect of being outside of the city and, and so forth, uh, again, there are all sorts of creative ways that developers come up with of funding things like that. I don't think this can be boiled down to if, they, if it's not in the city, it won't be built. Uh, nor do I think it's necessarily, it can be boiled down to we have to get it into the city or else it will be horrible. Um, I think that, again, these are complex issues that require uh, a great deal of study and consideration before a decision is made. Thank you. I agree with Mr. Payne. These are complex issues that require a lot of study and a lot of information for the City Council and the citizens of the City of Loveland. When this was first proposed to Council about two months ago, um, I asked, do we have data to show how much it will cost the City to extend police uh, force to uh, that area? Do we have data which shows how much it will cost to extend public works coverage? Do we have data which shows the traffic impact of 400 to 500 cars coming into downtown Loveland from the Gradleville when that area is ultimately developed. I asked several other questions. To each answer was, no, we don't know. So I suggested at that time, listen, maybe this is good, this annexation, maybe it's not good, but we don't have as a council the information that enables us to make a decision. Let's table this motion and gather that data, gather that information, so that we can demonstrate to our constituents, to our people that we represent, this is a good decision for the city of Loveland and for you as citizens. I was, that motion was not seconded even. And to this day, every time this issue comes up on, uh, before council, I have begged council, please slow down, let's get the information which enables us to make a reasonable, wise decision for this generation of Loveland uh, taxpayers and the next generation of Loveland taxpayers. Every time, my motion has not been seconded or it's been voted down. I'm the only member of council who has said, let's stop, breathe, and get the information that our citizens are entitled to. And frankly, a type two annexation, we know there's five parties involved, Miami Township, Grailville, the developer, Western Water, and the city of Loveland. The only one we know that will not benefit from that financially is the city of Loveland. So we owe it to you to find that information. I'm against it. Thank you. As has been said several times tonight, this, this, is, a com this is a complex issue. There's a lot of things going on there. I would be lying to you if I told you I know what a type 2 annexation is. <laughs> I know. I'm committed though, to learning what that means. Um, that's part of the process, is to learn some of these things that you don't know. And I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you and tell you all things, all these kinds of things that I just simply don't have the facts to back up. I refuse to do that. What I will say though is I think we need to have a seat at the table. So if it is not going to negatively impact the city of Loveland, and it gives us a seat at the table into what gets developed up there, how it's developed, how much green space we can have still up there, the connectivity we can provide from that development to downtown so that maybe those cars are not driving downtown, maybe they're walking downtown. If there's walkability, maybe we have the ability to, to cut off some of the traffic issues that may, may come from, stem from this. These are things that I think bear conversation. I think that they are worthy of being asked, and I, I think that in time these things will come out. I think that right where it stands right now, 
I don't see, because I don't know all the facts, but I stand in favor of this just because I think having a seat at the table and being able to give your opinion and be a part of the decision is better than not having a seat at the table, not being a part of the decision, and having whatever these other entities, the other four groupings want to put together, show up with it. Because if we don't have a seat at the table, and they do put something up there that we don't like as a community, and we didn't have a say in it, that puts us in a really precarious situation in my opinion. Most of the people have homes. Depending on the amount of land that you have, you have maybe a cow, some chickens, um, uh, a vegetable garden. And I, I want to share with you all, there is, there is a niche out there. People are moving that way to sustainability, even with their own animals and things. It's just not me up here just, just talking nonsense. Um, you know, do some research. There's, I guess the point I'm making is, there's, there's, and that's very green, and that would be, um, you know, obviously not as many automobiles, right? So, and, and I guess in my mind, it would be going from a town to kind of halfway rural to then more rural areas that extend from the Loveland City area. I am an agricultural person. <laughs> you know, that is a part of sustainability. You can't have economic prosperity with different aspects of green and agriculture. And um, it's just not Kim Lukens that, that thinks this. There's a lot of people that think that. So, um, there, there can be a way to get it done, you know, with uh, not all this traffic flow and stuff. And That's still, fine. yeah. I start my response with the answer to the question, and that is, yes, I am in favor of this organization, and here's why. The Grail came to us um, and started the annexation process by asking to be annexed in, and council has adopted a resolution that has uh, been revised and then passed on, um, and passed by council, is now sitting at uh, the, the county uh, uh, commissioner's office. They have to make a, a decision. But the reason why I'm, I'm in favor of this is the Grailville, or the Grail property, it's vacant now. Um, it will remain vacant? No. Something's going to happen out there. We can be part of it. We can't. We could not be part of it. It's up to uh, us to, to decide that. Um, it's, it's vacant land now. It was farm. It's not going to be a farm in the future. Um, if we annex the property in, it puts Lovell in, in a controlling mode, position. It gives us the ability to control density. It gives us the ability to control what kind of housing goes in here. If we don't annex it into the, property, into the city, Miami Township has control. Western Water was mentioned, that's who, um, that's who pro was, would provide the water. Um, if we don't annex it in, we could have multi-family units put up there. We could have an industrial park up there, or some other large development warehouse. That's going to control, that's going to increase us traffic, but it won't benefit us at all. 
and would hurt our infrastructure as well. Thank you. Time for one more. One more. Okay, here's the last question. Uh, this question um, is a general question, uh, and it is, what is your definition of progress for the citizens of Loveland? Mr. King, you may go first. What is my definition of progress uh, for the citizens of Loveland? I would say I would have to answer that personally because uh, that's not a question that's really come up yet that I've talked to anyone about. But for me personally, when I think of that question, I think of a place that having a place that I can raise my family, that I can enjoy, that I I like and I continue to like. A place where it doesn't change so much that I say, why are we living here? Um, you know, we don't want to see higher taxes. None of us wants to see that. We don't want to see congestion. We want to see a place where we can go downtown and enjoy ourselves. Um, you know, prosperity doesn't have to mean that everything is changing and getting bigger and getting more dynamic and, oh, you know, we've got, if we've got 10 of this, we need 20, or otherwise we're not making progress. We're not keeping up. Um, Loveland's a bedroom community, and, and frankly, that's why I live in Loveland. Uh, I was born and raised in a town of 300 people, believe it or not. Uh, there's subdivisions in Loveland bigger than the town where I grew up. And so um, I like the, the slightly bucolic sense that we have in Loveland. I, I like what we have. I also like that there's a bike trail close by. I like that there's restaurants close by. I like that there's all those things. And so it, you know, and I forget who it was. Someone said tonight, you know, the word quaint. And I've been trying to think of words that describe our city, and quaint is one of those that comes up to my mind. And so, to me, prosperity and, and moving forward, and when I talk about the balance of moving forward, it doesn't include becoming Blue Ash. It doesn't include becoming Marymont. It is being lovely, because that's why I chose to live here. So I, I guess that would be my answer. Thank you. <clears throat> So it's been referenced numerous times tonight, um, the city has a congestion problem. I think we can all agree to that. So one element of progress, from my perspective, would be addressing that congestion problem proactively. We can do that by examining the three or four intersections of downtown, which almost all of our 95% of the traffic in that area flows through. I think those can be redesigned. I think that we can obtain citizen involvement, citizen input, and the, and the input of experts on that. So A, progress would be um, increase in, in improving those intersections in a way that proactively addresses the congestion in downtown Buffalo. I think B, uh, we have, the, the downtown area is very fine, very quaint. It will not be quaint if we put a 300 seat parking garage in there, by the way, uh, but uh, be that as it may, there are, there are opportunities on Loveland Madeira, um, also in our, in our Commerce Park, that we can uh, extend some uh, redevelopment and attract other businesses in those areas uh, to maybe dress it up, to, to spruce up that area and make it more inviting, such as our downtown is. So that would be another element of progress. I can tell you what progress is not. Progress is not moving forward with an annexation without the information and data uh, which demonstrates to our citizens that this is good for you. We haven't generated that data. We don't have that information. And, and our council is inappropriate in moving forward with that annexation uh, until that information is gathered so we can show our citizens this is a good move for you. I can tell you what progress is not also, is rezoning an area from single family to multifamily, resulting in 25 condominiums where seven single-family homes were based um, to, to find the will of the people. Progress means listening to and serving our citizens. Thank you. I would define progress as incremental change that continues to enhance our community. 
I don't want to see major, major changes anywhere on the horizon. I moved here 10 years ago, some people moved here 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago for a reason. And I want the reason I'm still here to be that this is a great place to live, a quaint, tight-knit community <laughs> that has good family values. The reason I moved here, the reason I moved our kids here, the reason we wanted to raise our children here is we wanted some place that we could call home where we knew our neighbors, our neighbors cared about us, we cared about our neighbors. We go to the homecoming parade every year. We have festivals downtown. It's a great place to raise a family. I don't want that to materially change. That being said, change is going to happen. There's, there's no stopping change. We can either get better or we can get worse, but we're going to change and we're going to develop and we're going to continue to move the city forward. We need to make sure those changes are incremental, they're small, they're strategic, they're well thought out, they're fiscally responsible, so that we can all look each other in the eye at the end of the day and say this place is a better place today to live than it was yesterday. And if we can do that every day and keep moving the city forward in that way, then I think we're doing right by each other as neighbors and as members of the community. Thank you. Progress to me is um, looking at what we already have. We have buildings and homes that are vacant that um, I guess the city owns there on the bottom of 48 there in Lalo Madera. We have places that are uh, police, the military um, complex that the military individuals, that was a military focus. Yeah, they're looking to lease the whole building because people are working from home. And so honestly, you guys, I mean, it's been a a shock in our culture. It has been a huge shift in our culture since the pandemic. And the reality is, you know, we are we are not where we were two years ago or a year ago. I mean, there's this um, there's this new program in the fall of uh, this this year, and it talks about sustainability, security, resilience. Um, the progress for to me is to really look at what's what's there. I mean, we're going to have empty, you know, most likely these empty buildings, and what are we really going to do with what we already have here? So it's back to sustainability. You know, a lot of the trades are resurfacing. Um, the people that are in the trades are retiring, and there's there there is just this new wave of thirty and thirty year olds, twenty year olds that want to take a structure and they want to redo the electric. They want to you know, um, do the floors and a, and a, go, go get old barn wood and stuff like that. And so um, progress to me is really looking at how we can uh, move forward, but then use our natural resources very wisely. Um, and uh, you know, not put more uh, materials in the landfill. That's the whole climate climate control things that you know you hear about. This is all really good. Progress uh, for me is uh, 64 years here. Uh, I've seen progress. Well, when when I was in, uh, in grade school, it was 3,000 people. Now it's, like I said, 13,000 homes. Progress is, comes from forward thinkers, people that, that put their minds together and come up with ways to improve and, and uh, move our city forward. One of the things that um, always came up, it, what came up tonight is the park or the uh, track. We don't have a grid. We don't have 3rd Street, 2nd Street, 4th Street, but, you know, East and West, we have a square. So we have to confine ourselves to that square. What can we do? Well, our square is in pretty good shape. Unfortunately, because of the fire that happened several years ago, um, we've benefited from it because downtown is thriving. <clears throat> so we got to think, what's next? And that's where we just talked about. They had the long Madeira corridor uh, meeting. That's where the next growth is going to happen, up that way. Coming in with new 
streets, streetscapes, landscape, benches, parks, wider uh, sidewalks for pedestrians and bikes. Um, you know, but the other things that we have to continue to look at is what new entertainment is coming, what parks, you know, what do we have, how can we improve them, although we've done so much improvement to our parks lately. But the, the growth uh, and the progress um, takes considerable uh, input from the residents as well as positive uh, forward thinkers. Thank you. Well, I think this is the most difficult question of the night. <laughs> Insofar as you know, you got loaded terms in the question. You know, what is progress? I mean, progress is in itself not something that's desirable for so, a lot of people. A lot of people that when I knock on doors campaigning say they wish Loveland hadn't changed as much as it is. They they think it was the good old days. They'd like. Well, I think there's an equal number, not a greater number, of people living in this community that like the changes that have been made. That are people who are happy that they're here. That. They see us as a desirable, comfortable uh, place that we're proud to, to call home. And um, I know in this community there's a tremendous amount of people, including those of you who are out here tonight in the audience who are engaged, uh, who, who want to see what is the best in Loveland, which in some respects is a lot of what needs to be preserved. That doesn't need to be changed. I mean, we have a historic preservation regulation downtown to make sure it doesn't become something radically different. Uh, but at the same time, we know things that have enhanced the quality of life here. Uh, for It's a net good. It's not necessarily viewed by that way every, by everybody, especially those that see the traffic that it causes. But I think what we need to do is work together to you know, continue to allow for these enhancements that the people like, that visitors like, that our businesses like. So it's not just citizens, when I hear that, I think of residents. That's obviously a huge constituency, but so are our businesses, and so are people that, that come here and, and provide economic activity that voice the, the city. Um, so um, I think one thing that provides that, that good, that helps enhance what we have and not destroy it, is a parking garage. And that's why I'm in favor of it. I think it just makes good sense. Um, and in terms of people who um, have bought homes, I mean, they've been doing that in this neighborhood in our city for, for years. It's time. The 25 new people, I think, will be proud that they're there as opposed to um, upset that they made the decision to move into a new development, as we were when we moved into ours. All right, that uh, wraps up the questions. I want to thank everyone that posed a question tonight. I think they were uh, very good questions. And if you still have a question that didn't get uh, asked, uh, they, some of the candidates still might uh, hang around a little bit. You can come up to them and ask them individually. But now we're going to hear uh, two-minute closing statements uh, from each candidate. Uh, judges try to be fair, and so I'm, to try to be fair here, what we're going to do is reverse the order from when we did the opening statement. So I'm going to ask Mr. Ping to uh, start, followed by Mr. Phelps. Thank you, Judge. I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight, uh, especially to the, the Chamber and CC for uh, flashing cards at us all evening. Um, thank uh, to Loveland Magazine and David for, uh, for broadcasting this to those that couldn't be here. And thank you to all of you who took time out of your schedules to, to come here this evening and, and be with us, and those that are watching at home as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank Caleb. Wave your hat, Caleb. Young man here who shows that uh, there's still hope for the country. Uh, there are young people interested in such things. I believe that I can do this job. Uh, I think that I have qualifications for it. Um, I would welcome the opportunity to talk to any of you further about that and to demonstrate that for you. I think that, as I've already said this evening, it's important to listen but also to hear what people say. At the end of the day, you elect council to represent you, though. And that means sometimes we might disagree. I would hope that if we do disagree, that you would think that I have at least respected you and been fair and honest with you. I don't want to ever have anyone say that I was a misleading person or I was a liar or anything like that. You might say I don't like what he did, but at least you will know that I was honest with you every step of the way. 
Uh, I will do my best to decide well for all of Loveland uh, to the extent that I can, and uh, I would appreciate it if I could have your vote uh, this fall. I would also say one other thing. Um, tonight I saw in this group up here uh, many different opinions and things, but I just want to compliment uh, the three gentlemen that I'm running with because they demonstrated exactly the reasons why I chose to put my signs with theirs. It's not a cabal, it's just that we have a similar approach, and I liked what I heard, and so that's the reason why I'll be voting for those three guys. Yeah, thank you to everyone that put this on, and thank you for coming. And, you know, this is difficult to answer these questions in two minutes, and I apologize if I went over a little bit. I realize I violated the rules, and then I'm, I'm a, an attorney, in which if I did it in court, I'd be maybe thrown in jail for it. So thank you for not doing that. But uh, let me just say, you know, because I don't think maybe some of these subjects get a full airing, but if you need to, feel free to email any of us. I'm sure we would be happy to dialogue further on these things. Um, I, I do want to say that um, I am, again, proud to be a Lovelander. I think this community has so much good going for it. Uh, it's really unique. I, I have practiced law with people that live in a variety of different communities, and everybody's saying how Loveland has become something quite attractive, not only to them as visitors, but for a place to live and raise kids. And, you know, honestly, I, I think I like being in what motivates me and why I'm running again. It's interesting, we didn't have a, a term limits question in this uh, forum as we've had in the past. I, I'm the guess the one that will have the most experience on council, uh, having done two full terms, and I'm seeking a third. And I'll tell you why. I, I mean, I, I think I've touched about it, but I, I like being part of what truly is, I think, a good, cooperative, highly functioning city. And, and city council is just one part of that. And I like getting things done, not through the exercise of forced will or of being uh, overly aggressive in debate or anything else, but rather because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to be open, to be transparent, to present initiatives, both legislative and others, to listen to citizens, to, it's that decision-making process that I want to be part of, and I want to be part of a team doing beneficial things for the city, uh, both as it is now and will be in the future, so that those kids will say, this is a great city to be in. Thank you. After years and years of saying no, I don't want to be on, in, on city council to people that already asked me. Four years ago, I said yes. And there was a reason for that. And I think many of you know the reasons. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that's the reason why I got into politics. I've spent a lifetime here. And to be honest, being on council over the last four years, it takes a couple of years for you to get the hang of everything, the budgets, all your resolutions and ordinances, how they work, how they function, how does how is, how is the government operate? Um, because, of, like I said, I wasn't in, in politics before. The next four years are going to be, my, my, my uh, campaign committee is me awarding four level. It was that four years ago. When it was four years ago, it was Neil Worry, four level, vote for me. The next four years are going to be Neil Worry for you, four level. I want to get out there and work harder. Since I'm retired now, I have more time to do it. Um, and I just, you know, I grew up here. Loveland is a fantastic place. And I'm proud to be part of it. And I'd like to have your vote moving forward so we can continue to make uh, Loveland a better place. Thank you. I, uh, I said that I was an out-of-the-box thinker, independent thinker. I'm definitely a forward thinker. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, quality of life, 
If you do research on it, United Nations, countries and countries and countries have come up with this conclusion that for sustainability, you have three spheres, the environment, the social and the economic aspect. And if the spheres are exactly the same circumference, then sustainability is in the middle. And I don't see sustainability in Loveland City. I see a lot of congestion. I see not a lot of diversity. Um, uh, for economic prosperity, I see a, a, a lot of one type of economic prosperity, specifically restaurants. Um, and I just, I'm not, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just saying there's just other ways. There are other ways to bring economic prosperity to to us. I mean, there's tourism that really focuses I have on biking. You know, I'm a natural resource. Take our natural resources and enhance our natural resources. Because of COVID, our health, our health has been heightened, our health awareness has been heightened, and, and you know, it's, it's outdoors, it, you know, depression, anxiety, cancer, um, heart problems. I mean, just do the research and you listen to the news, it's outdoors, outdoors, and we have such a, a beautiful place here that is becoming more concrete in my in my thoughts, um, and it could be really, really, you know, a, a special place to to just to stop all that and to look at how we can bring people here um, in a sustainable way. So, real quickly, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality. That's time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Without without you guys showing up and and asking questions, this would be quite a boring affair. So I appreciate you guys being interested in what's going on here at Love One, and I appreciate you guys watching at home tonight, taking the time to be be interested and be an informed voter come come November. You've heard a lot of different viewpoints. You've heard a lot of comments tonight. Uh, I think everybody is representing themselves uh, very well tonight. So. I want to close for myself with a couple of three things that I, I, I really want to impress upon you. I hope I have throughout my entire the entire night. One is fiscal responsibility. I do not take lightly the charge of handling tax dollars. One of the one of my favorite things to watch is our city manager Dave Kennedy get giddy when he finds grants because he's a magician in finding grants and alternative ways to fund things and we need people to continue to think that way that everything we do in the city doesn't have to go on the backs of our taxpayers because we're paying state taxes and we're paying federal taxes too where those those monies are coming from so let's tap into those other places and, and Dave your city manager does a great job and I, and I encourage you to continue to find those alternative ways to fund it the other is maintain the character and charm of public I moved here because of I loved the small town feel I love the way our downtown looked. I love being here. I love <laughs> the tightness of this community. And I don't want to do anything that would, that would neglect that or change that in any way. I want people to be as comfortable moving here in 20 years as I was moving here 10 years ago. And the last thing is the best, the most important thing I can offer you is honest communication, honest and transparent communication. There's nothing more important to the functioning of a city than community listening or government listening to the community. That's what we, that's what we are here to do, is to serve you. And I hope I've earned your support throughout our night. Have a nice night, guys. Thank you, and thank all the candidates uh, tonight. Appreciate your participation. Um, there are some really vitally important decisions confronting the City of Loveland and the City Council over the next four years. You've heard three of them discussed tonight. Annexation, the parking garage, rezoning, and I'll throw traffic in there as well. You've also heard vitally different positions as far as the best way to address those. You have to decide, as citizens, what kind of council do you want for the next four years? What kind of council member do you want for the next four years? Do you want a council member who listens to people, who receives public input willingly, who solicits public input, 
and represents the interests of those people in votes, even when he or she is the only person voting the other way. And that's happened to me numerous times over the last four years. I've grown to expect it, and it's just part of part of the uh, landscape that I, I dealt with because I'm doing it for you, and I'm representing the interests of you, the people, and I always will. Or do you want a council which essentially votes in lockstep, which punishes those who may vote against it, um, at the majority position? Um, a council which unfortunately will not share the financial implications of important issues like annexation. Like, like the uh, parking garage and other important matters before. I would say, suggest to you that you want a council which invites public discussion. You want one that thinks carefully about the financial impacts of this decision, which serves as a steward of your tax dollars, which cares about every penny which is spent by the city council. We have a great city. These decisions are really going to impact the future of the city for you and for your children. And I ask for your vote. I will always represent your interests, even in the face of whatever headwinds I may face on City Council. Thank you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. All right. Can we get our big round of applause for our candidates? Thank you again, Tim Butler, John Hart, Kim Lukens, Neil Ari, Ted Phelps, and Kip Ping. Thank you guys so much for being here. Again, the chamber stance is it is so important to bring these issues to the forefront and we want to make sure that our voters are well informed so that when you go to the voting polls in November, you know exactly what you're voting for. And again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Judge Brad, Brad Greenberg, excuse me, and uh, Mayor and Pastor Bob Mountshaw. And we'll let you all get home and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, candidates, you're welcome to stick around for a little bit. We've got some cleanup to do. Not, you don't have to do the cleanup. You're welcome to stick around and talk while we clean up. And again, Lola Magazine, thank you for being here. Thank you for putting this out live. And everyone, have a very good night.